in the design world, we can't stay with a solution that we've always had. It's always about finding a better way because there's competition out there. You know, it's a it's a dog eat dog world <laughs> out there. And if you can't find a way to adapt and to change to find the solution for a new for for any problem, then you're going to fall behind. So it's all about staying relevant to the um, to the problem at, at hand. Hello and welcome. I'm Shane Parrish, and you're listening to The Knowledge Project, a podcast dedicated to mastering the best of what other people have already figured out. I'm going to help you better understand yourself and the world around you by exploring the ideas, methods, and mental models from some of the most outstanding people in the world. Together, we'll extract the timeless lessons from their biggest successes, as well as their hard times. The Knowledge Project is part of Farnham Street a website dedicated to helping you think better and live better. Farnham Street puts together a free weekly newsletter that I think you'll love. It's called Brain Food, and it comes out every Sunday. Our team scours the internet for the most mind-expanding books, articles, and resources, so you can spend less time searching and more time learning. Discover what you're missing at fs.blog. Today, I'm talking with legendary automobile designer Frank Stevenson. Frank is known all around the world for his designs. You've probably seen them. They range from mass consumer cars like the Mini and the Fiat 500 to the extremely limited runs numbering in the hundreds of the McLaren P1. We're gonna talk design, creativity, and the future of cars in this amazing conversation. It's time to listen and learn. Frank, I'm so happy to get to talk to you today. Thanks, Shane. I'm uh, pretty excited to be here. Thanks for having me today. One of the interesting stories I came across when I was doing research on you is you were in the top 10 in the world for motocross racing. And I think it was your dad who told you, this is the last race for you when you were 22 or 23. What happened? Um, nothing much happened. That's probably the, the, um, the problem I had. Um, I was doing well. I mean, uh, it's all relative, I guess. Um, I'd done really well from when I'd started right off the bat. I'd, um, been pretty successful and, uh, came up through the ranks that you have to go through to get to that level, that professional level. I came through those pretty successfully and pretty quickly. Um, and so it, it, it wasn't a struggle, uh, on my side, to, you know, to, to, to go through years of, um, of fighting and you know, really trying hard to get to the top, it was, it felt almost pretty natural. And so I wasn't really, you know, super, uh, super, uh, crazy, super inspired or super happy to be at that level, uh, in the way that when you reach that level, it almost seemed like a natural thing for me to, to arrive to, um, the problem was, uh, and it wasn't a problem for me, it was uh, when, when you're racing, it's just fun to do it, um, that I'd reached a level where I probably wasn't going to go any higher. Uh, I mean, being a professional is, is pretty high in anybody's book, but the problem was I wasn't up at the very, very top where I was on the podium every every weekend or uh, finishing up in the top three. I was basically your, your, your in the 10 uh, range of, of riding on that world-class level. So... Uh, that could be seen as pretty pretty good and, and, and a pretty high level. But at the same time, from my father's point of view, it wasn't ever going to make a huge difference to my uh, my life or to my career. And he was always pushing that I, you know, you, you not even third would have been enough or second. For him, it was always, you know, you, you either look at being at the very top or try something else. So... Uh, due to that reason that I was pretty much never finishing in the top three, I was, um, uh, he, he, he didn't tell me to do it, but he advised me that you're probably going to be better off if you start looking for a, a different direction in life, something where you can be or could be the best uh, at what you do. And it wasn't just doing something else. It was always coming from him that what you do you want to be the best at it. So before you get stuck in a rut or, or a dead end or something, then you probably should start thinking about getting out of this and, and doing something else with your life. And luckily enough, uh, I, I listened to him. I uh, 
didn't want to obviously listen to him because I was having the time of my life. I mean, at that age, your 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 hormones are raging, your testosterone is raging, and racing is one of the biggest ways you know you can satisfy that craving for for um, for that kind of excitement that 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 you crave. So. Um, it was tough for me at that point to to, to sort of try to see his uh, his reasoning for it. Um, I always thought I could keep on improving, um, which which you probably can do. I mean, they say that if you do something you know enough for ten thousand hours, ten thousand times, you're going to be pretty good at it. But I'd already done those ten thousand hours, I think, and I still wasn't getting any better. So. I'm glad that um, he said that, although at that time of my life, I was pretty, pretty upset that I was uh, agreeing to, uh, to change my direction, I guess, to get out and do something uh, a little bit different from that direction. So, so looking back, you know, hindsight is, is, is 100%. So I, I'm glad I did it and I got on to something else that, that was uh, probably more fulfilling in the long run for me. It sounds like a pretty rational sort of approach to comments mm. like that. Do you do you remember how it made you feel at the time? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say depression, but pretty low because I knew that if I got out, it was going to be a hundred percent out. Um, and that that experience of racing, where you're you're traveling quite a bit and you're 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 sort of getting exposed to a, an international outlook on life at a very young age. Um, that's wonderful. I mean, you learn so much just by being around people who, who have so many different experiences in life and, and, and basically you're doing something that you love to do and you're getting, you know, even paid to do it. And, and there's a lot of, um, exposure at that level. So it's, it's a rewarding thing to do when you're, when you're young and it does keep you towing the line, I guess you could say in terms of, uh, health and, uh, and, and a mental approach to life or mental outlook. Um, you're always, you know, pushing yourself to the limit or what you think is your own limit, but then you have to, you know, make sure that that, that, that level you're pushing to or that limit is, is not just average. Nobody cares in racing about who's average. It's always about who's, who's the winner. And so it does train you, I guess, for the rest of your life in a pretty awesome way of, of not being satisfied ever with, with anything unless you're at the very top or putting out your absolute best performance. Um, so I think, you know, looking back, I'm kind of glad that that was one of the ways I started out um, when I, you know, obviously left school and was able to, to do something that I was personally, you know, re- involved with the the effort needed to, to, to be good or to, to excel. So that, that was a bit of formation for me, I guess, for the rest of everything else has come after that. Was that tough advice for your father to give or was that just the type of person he was? He, uh, he loved racing. I mean, uh, part of the reason why I was able to get into it was because he, 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 he loved it himself. He was, uh, uh, you know, his philosophy is, is exactly that. You have to always try to excel, always try to push yourself to another level and racing for him or anything in life was pretty much that, that kind of, uh, competition, you know, that, that mental, uh, approach to life. So he saw racing as a, as a good, as a great character builder for me, I think. Um, and because I went for it or actually tried to seek it out as a, as a, as a thing to do after I'd graduated from high school or just as I was graduating from high school, he was all for it. He, you know, it's, uh, it's a great direction for uh, a child or a, a young daughter or son to, to put themselves into a competitive, atmosphere competitive environment where it allows you to or 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 um, stimulates you to become more than what you think you are and there's a lot of ups and ups and downs along the way obviously it's it's just like life you know you you crash and burn a lot of times <laughs> but at the same yeah. time it's a it's a great learning experience and um you know you learn a lot of things in racing that you would never learn in in school um and and not just about you know the speed factor or anything like that it's 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 a mind game, like everything in, in, in the world where you want to be the best. It doesn't come down so much or 100% to talent. It comes down to the extra 10% or the 1% that makes you a little bit better than the other guy, which is how you approach it mentally. And if you're not mentally prepared, it doesn't matter how much talent you have. You're, you're, you probably won't do that well in the end. How did you go about mentally preparing? Um, 
Well, like anybody, I guess, uh, first of all, I saw it as a passion for me to, to be able to, to do that. You know, I didn't start thinking I'm just going to do it for a year or anything like that. I just thought my father said, you know, let's sure have a go and let's see how you mature through it. And we'll take it as it goes. You don't have to start working right away because he had a, a, a dealership, a car dealership in, in southern Spain since the early 60s. And it was kind of expected that when I graduate, graduated from high school, I would go there to work. So I wasn't really needing to have to go look for a job. That's a kind of enviable oh, position, I guess, for yeah. a lot of people to be in. Although a lot of people just go straight to college. I finished pretty well in, in my graduating class, but I had no intentions of going to the university to study or, or anything like that. I, I finished university in, in Madrid, Spain, and, uh, and that was pretty much it. And I thought, um, I'll just uh, see if I can become something in, in, in racing. And my father was all for it. So, uh, so I went for it. But the idea of going through it and becoming a, a, an elite racer was never on my mind. It was just push and see how far I can go. And, and that mental approach, uh, allowed me, I think, that if I can dedicate myself 100% to this, I don't have any distractions, other distractions in life or or, or um, anything else that I wanted to do instead, then that allow me the time and the energy and the, uh, the dedication to to try to be, uh, you know, one of the top writers. And, and obviously, you're at that first instant, you're not looking to be a world-class writer. You're just trying to be the you know, the regional champ or the national champ, and then you go on from there. Um, but yeah, I put a lot of, lot of energy into it because I just loved it. It's that typical thing that if you're doing something that you love, you're going to put that much more effort into it. And the rewards are, are fr from doing well are, are sort of a, a catalyst to do, do even better. And so I spiraled into that train of thought where um, the more successful I became, the more I wanted to do it and the more effort I put into it and, and the happier I became, the more satisfied and fulfilled I became. So, um, it was, it was a great time in my life. I'm so happy I had that, that time in my life and, uh, didn't just wander off and, you know, get stuck in, in a nine to five job or nine to six or whatever. It's, um, it was just a time in my life where I could, um, get on a motorcycle uh, mentally think that I have to uh, be relentless in, in that pursuit of being the first guy to the finish line and do what it takes. Um, uh, morally correct, of course, you don't want to uh, do anything that's out of line, but uh, a lot of people find ways to get around those rules. But um, finishing at the very top was always that, 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 that goal I had. So, and, and like I said, my father saw that at some point when I was sort of four years into the professional career, um, that it wasn't going to happen. Um, because I guess you, you can reach your limit. Um, I hate thinking about that, but, um, well, there's reaching it and like admitting that you've reached it, right? Like being on the self honesty required to. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Um, the thing is you, you sometimes don't see it. Other people see it. And that's, that's a fact about a lot of things in life. You can, you can kid yourself quite a bit if you're not really self analytical about, about the truth. And, um, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to have a parent who was, who was able to tell me what, you know, he loved me as much as any parent can love a child. And at the same time, he wanted the best for me and he wanted me to be happy, but he could see from the outside that pretty much, um, you're good, but you're not good enough and good isn't good enough. Kind of that approach. And so, so how did you get from quitting motocross professionally anyway, to design school? Um, yeah, that's kind of interesting because they seem like two completely different yeah, uh, yeah. things in life. I mean, one you have to be pretty bulky, and the other one you have to have pretty lithe fingers. I would imagine. You know? And um, no, I, I'd always been very physically active since I was since I can remember. I was a, a very active, physically active young kid, and uh, and also very competitive uh, from very early age on. I, I just loved being competitive, um, but I also had this. Um, this artistic wiring in me, which I, I, I was never really able to, to, to understand, but it was just everything for me was from the very beginning, I would see everything from an artistic point of view, um, as well as obviously a, a technical point of view, because my parents were very uh, different. My father being um, basically a northerner, uh, he was very, 
I don't know, very, very analytical and very technical about everything and everything had to be, you know, sort of measured. Uh, you'd have to be able to put a number to it. And that included everything about, you know, being precise about absolutely everything and very detail oriented. Whereas my mother was very much on the other side of the spectrum where she was all about the artistic value of things and being very uh, creative and, 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 you know, that, that went from everything from the art to music to culture and everything. So there was a bit of blending in that. But the, the artistic side stuck, you know, I guess you inherit quite a few genes from mm-hmm. both, but it seemed rather split in my side. Whereas I, I mean, I did love what my father had about that, that technical side uh, of what he was always teaching me. Um, but for my mother, I learned the, uh, the, the, the appreciation for the arts and, and that kind of sort of combined and I guess shaped my way of seeing things from a very young age. Uh, but the idea that if I, I mean, I started out obviously loving, um, you know, the, the, the industrial side of things, I guess you could say the mechan- the machines and the sounds and what makes horsepower and, uh, you know, everything like that but also there was uh, like I said the artistic side where I, I I started from a very young age of drawing and and if I was you know at home my mother many times had to kick me out of the house to get me out and get some fresh air because all I ever wanted to do at that youngish age when you're still you know preschool and around that, around that age I was just drawing hours and hours on end I, I loved colors I loved uh, shapes and I would just draw and she, I think she might have been a bit worried that this guy is, you know, he's going to be a little bit of a, a one-off because he doesn't like to get out and play with the other kids. Um, I would spend an unreal amount of time just in my room drawing. And, um, you know, kids nowadays, regretfully, they don't do that so much. They might you know, be on the Playstations or whatever. But um, it was a great time to be able to... To, to, to develop myself in that artistic way. And I, so, so what I'm trying to say is that I basically developed uh, and never stopped drawing. I was always interested in, 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 in creating things like that and drawing things. Um, when my father said that, you know, you, you better start thinking or you should start thinking about something else, um, my options were, were pretty wide. I, I obviously had that dealership, his dealership that I could go back to. But for some reason, even though that was fun for me, because I remember a lot of summers having to spend, you know, uh, away from school working in the body shop, which is what I loved. Um, I, I loved to paint. I loved to uh, modify the cars and do a lot of the, the body work and things like that. That was the artistic side, obviously. Um, but when he said, you have to start thinking, or you should start thinking about something else to do in life, I, I reverted back to that Um that hope that I could actually turn drawing into a profession. Um, and I had this love of cars since I was about 10 and I spent, uh, many years, I guess, uh, those, those years drawing cars, not even knowing that it was actually a profession or something that you could do for, you know, to earn money doing or anything like that. I just thought, uh, car design was something that, that you, people did at home kind of thing. Um, but I, I did develop this talent or, or furthered this talent of being able to be creative drawing in the drawing of products. And it was real serendipity when I found out that there was actually a university or college in the U.S. in, in Los Angeles that was um, dedicated to training uh, young people to become car designers. And it was right at that time that my father had suggested the, the, the moving out of the motocross direction. And I couldn't believe that, you know, this college was basically the place to go for car designers who wanted to, to, to make that their profession. I, I was, it was an, uh, an awakening moment for me. And a lot of people, a lot of people seem to think that like design college is easy but that that wasn't the experience you had at all yeah no 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 it was it was tough um i guess it's a dream profession and uh, a lot of kids nowadays kind of look up to the guys who are doing it and thinking wow you know these are the these are the pros and uh they've made it the thing is car design is not a big profession it's there are not a lot of car designers in the world um because simply car companies don't need a lot of designers they you know even the big ones they try to keep their teams pretty small so there aren't a lot of opportunities out there to become a car designer. Um, I remember when I applied for Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, um, 
they said, well, you can't just apply and expect to come. You have to go through a, a selection process where we'll determine your portfolio. If your portfolio is great, good enough for you to, to be uh, here with us and uh, the starting level there is it's extremely high. They have a huge amount of uh, people that apply and a very, very small percentage are allowed to, to even you know, to, to start. So um, I remember our first day of class uh, when I finally did get the, uh, the approval to start there. Um, they had, uh, or we were 30 students in the class and they told us, uh, you know, that ratio of, of people who apply to people who actually get accepted to start. And it's, it's scary. It's, uh, it's, I think it was about 3%. Um, when they tell that to, when they told that to us, we were, you know, pretty proud of the fact that you're there, but then they cut us down to size when they said that, you know, we never have more than 10 students of the 30 that start finish. So, so it's pretty tough to get through that, that curriculum. And in fact, when we finished, there was only six of us from that starting class of 30, 30 that had started originally. So um, it's grueling. It's an mad, I can't, I can't tell you enough how, how difficult it, they make it to get through with reason because like I said there aren't that many car designers out there 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 isn't a need for that many car designers out there so they make sure that the ones that do get through the four-year program um, are the ones that are you know competitive enough or, or good enough to actually start start on on, on the ground running basically so um, it, it's it's a it's a real boot camp, um, and and the guys who make it through are pretty much prepared right away. You know, it's a. It's a Did you need to motivate yourself through that? I, I think I remember in a video I was watching about you that you spent like sixteen hour days and used to go home and make instant coffee at yeah. like eleven p.m. <laughs> and, and like. What was mm. did you love that grind or was that process sort of like challenging at times and how did you get yourself through it I guess I guess most people would see it as a grind or or difficult I I thrived there I I, I relished every single minute I was there it's kind of um it's kind of like a person who loves pain in that kind of situation because I I loved the challenge of of proving yourself there. Um, it kills a lot of people. I mean, not literally, but it does, does make a lot of people, uh, finally give up or, you know, at some stage along the way, it's kind of like running a, a marathon and you, you take a break, you're never going to get back up to speed again. But I, like I said, I, I, I really was, uh, I didn't see it as a grind or anything like that. I just, I just saw it as the, path I needed to, the logistics I needed to get through to get to the end. For me, the end goal was to get a, you know, a job and, and become a great designer one day. But the, the process of getting there was just the path I had to accept or the, the obstacles, I guess you could say, that I needed to, to, um, to, to overcome to, to get there. It was, a, it was a logistical approach that I used. <laughs> Whatever it takes, I'll do it. How bad do you want it? I wanted it very badly, and I didn't. Uh, none of that seemed like it was going to stop me in my tracks or make me rethink what I wanted. Um, I had this vision right from the beginning that I'm going to make it through, and um, and I'm going to I'm going to become happy because I, I'll be able to do what I always want to do. So it wasn't it wasn't in any way um, a negative experience. It was a difficult, hard experience. You know, it's like taxing your body and your mind to the limit. But when anybody, I think anybody who's, who who does that or who has done that probably will recount that with um, with a positive uh, spin to it. You know, they don't see it as negative. Anything that's difficult to to achieve, um, when you look back at it, you don't criticize it. You, you sort of think, you know, uh, it's kind of like Green Beret training or, or you know, some uh, black Yeah, ops. if you get through it, you look at it back fondly. But Absolutely. if you don't make it through, you kind of... <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> you have the other viewpoint. <laughs> so, but, so then you, you, you ended up at Ford right after, right? I did, yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I, what happens is halfway through the big three at the time, the Chrysler, General Motors, General Motors and Ford would come and check out you know, who has the potential to become uh, uh, a good employee or somebody they'd look forward to on graduation. So what they'll do is they'll sift them out around halfway through. They'll come to the college and look through the, uh, the middle ranks of the, uh, of, the, of the classes and see who's, who's up and coming and has talent or whatever or the, the mindset. And so Ford, uh, I guess they took a shine to me and said, look, if, um, 
if you sign with us now, we'll, we'll help you get through the rest of the way on the cost side of it. And we'll be happy to give you a, a starting position with us on graduation. So that obviously for me, when they said that was a, a no brainer, I had to, you know, I thought that'll take a lot of the weight off of it. And um, the main thing is to get my foot in the door on graduation. So what better way than to know that that door is already cracked open. So, um, yeah, I, I accepted, obviously, and uh, got through the next two years pretty, pretty, um, I wouldn't say easily, but I uh, had that, like I said, the weight off my shoulders of how to get the financial packages in place. And I went to Ford straight out of uh, uh, on graduation, and they had a position open for me in Detroit at the main headquarter, design headquarters in, in Detroit. But I'd grown up in Europe and I had no no desire to, to work and live in Detroit. And uh, I knew that Ford was an international company and they had their European design headquarters in Germany. And um, I thought, well, you know, I, I'd much rather work for you guys in Germany if that's possible. And they looked into it and said, sure, I've got a, a few openings that we could uh and you know, push around and uh, and have you take one of them in in the European studios in Cologne in Germany. Oh, that's that's awesome. So before we, uh, I want to get into specifics about car design, but before we do that, I have some sort of I have questions around not only design but design in a in a corporation. So how do you like? What's the tension between engineering and design? What's the difference? Uh, it it goes goes both ways, Shane. You can have. Um, I'll tell you what it is. The bread and butter companies have have an awful relationship between the designers and the engineers, whereas the high flying, the the exotics have a great relationship between the engineers and the designers. The reason being is the small, not the smaller companies, but the ones that work well or or, or look to be in volume sellers, they've got to please everybody all the time, or that at least is their goal. Whereas the the more limited in the say call them the exotic companies aren't i mean of course they want to sell everything they make but they can afford to sell less less in the end run so the results that a or, or, or when a designer is basically the crazy guy in the organization he's the one that comes up with these ideas that pretty much you know scare everybody uh at the beginning because they're five years out from production and the designer gets paid the bucks to to basically come up with the, these ideas that are innovative and engineers don't like typically don't like to be pushed uh, in this innovative direction because it puts, puts them at, uh, you know, the, they're not at ease with trying to have to figure out something very quickly that hasn't been done before. They they would rather rely on past solutions and the current status quo to, to turn out work that they're guaranteed that will not fail, that it's quality and they, they, they know what it's going to cost. The moment a designer gets all excited and starts uh, envisioning the future and coming out with ideas that haven't been proven or developed, that puts him at risk that he's not going to be able to deliver. So, um, I mean, budgets are budget, whether you're budgets, whether you're working with a small company or a bigger company, you still have to stick to the budget. But the the designers and the engineer relationship with, um, say, a, a standard uh, company is difficult, can be difficult at times. I've had many, many experiences where my dreams and wishes and visions weren't able to be realized because of the negative pressure from, and not only from the uh, the, the engineers, but also from the other departments, marketing and, and finance. They're all in there to make a buck. Pretty much it's, it's the way corporate, big corporations run. And so they'll put the binders or, or obstacles in your way uh, in order for you basically just to calm yourself down and turn out pretty much uh the standard solution so you're you're working and you're excited because you're doing things that you know start as a spark in your brain and one day you'll see them on the road but it could be so much more and that's why i think a lot of times these companies will do concept cars to show that they are forward thinking uh they'll they'll show that their design team is innovative and that but the concept cars aren't the real cars they're oftentimes just you know to, to get the public excited about what could be coming. But at the end of the day, so many of these concept cars that we see at the motor shows never turn out to be real. And they're so watered down when they go to production that you don't oftentimes don't see a resemblance between what's shown at a motor show or an auto show and what actually comes out on the, on the road. Whereas when you work um, with a higher end company where you're, you're expected to do something innovative, these, like I said, the higher end uh, exotic companies need 
to stand out. They need to do something that's better than what else, whatever else the competition is doing. And, and it's fierce. I mean, at that top end, you're getting companies, obviously the budgets are bigger, like I said, but the only thing that can make a difference is basically what your calling card or what the company's calling card represents. So the concept cars that we produce uh, at that end for a motor show, auto show, pretty much are the ones going into um, into production. So what that requires is a is an engineer who's as excited and as visionary and as crazy or, or believing that the impossible is possible as the designer. So um, it, it's a lot funner, obviously, to work in that end for a designer, whereas, you know, the, the I mean, designers have to basically you're, you're told to do a job or a brief you have to adhere to, but when the brief lets you, you know, stretch the limits, then then it is that's where you have a blast. Problem is, it doesn't reach everybody at that at that end of the market. A lot of people in the higher end market volumes and markets at the higher end markets will just tend to um, to sell very few cars. But um, how important is it for the designer to create that vision of the future internally, in, in terms of a sales aspect? Um, versus like just creating something that they yeah. think is amazing and, and hoping or praying, I guess, that people will see the same vision. That's the problem with a lot of companies. They're in it for the, um, you know, the profit. They're not in it for the actual excitement of bringing something, you know, exceptionally new to the market. So they're, they're playing it safe. The whole thing with a designer is designers aren't wired to play it safe. They're wired to, to take risks and companies are risk adverse. So a designer is happy, obviously, when he gets a, a, a position to be able to be a designer within a company, you're basically able to create your babies. You know, you, you have a thought, which is that sort of initial phase of, of ideation phase of creating a new product. Um, but at the end of the day, if that product is not the best that you could have made it or, or is shot down along the way in different ways by, by other people, then you're not really going to be ultimately satisfied. So um, if you ask most designers what the, their, their favorite job in the world would be, a car designer, you're always going to find them answering, well, I'd love to work for a, a high-end exotic car company because they'll let me or, or challenge me or allow me to, to do my best work. And that excitement of doing your best work rubs off throughout the org organization. And you get much happier people in these organizations working as teams. You, you get a lot of momentum and excitement builds up when you're allowed to express your creativity and, and, and things go smoother. And basically, you're, do you think you're, that's a little bit limiting though? And, and I'm, I'm speaking in the sense of, it might not have been your best design, but it probably was the most impactful when you redesigned the Fiat 500. Mm. And I say impactful because you you probably, I mean, th through that and in yeah. other things, but that saved the company. It saved hundreds of thousands of jobs. It saved bankruptcy. It yeah, it, it, it did, Shane. It did, absolutely. Um, but again, the brief there was, was a little bit different. The brief there was, I mean, Fiat, no, they're 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 a wealthy company. No matter what people think, you know, you think of Fiat as not an expensive product, but they're massive. I mean, in terms of what they were selling in the earlier days, I wouldn't say in the time when the five hundred came around, but um, or the Cinquecento, as they call it. Um, but in those days, they 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 were, as I call it, in the dire straits because they weren't they weren't able to sell uh, very many products on the world stage. They were sort of. Um, they, they, they'd missed a step or two steps and they were stumbling along and, and suddenly they found themselves in a position where they needed instantly a solution that would generate profits. And, and so the design solution was how can we create something quickly that will have a world imp or not a world, just a, a huge impact um, around the world. Eventually, obviously it came to the U S but in Europe, it had to, it had to pretty much, in the brief, save the company because they weren't selling much. And, uh, of course, you know, if you want to do a, a, a car that sort of has that kind of impact to society, um, you have to reach for the emotional factor that makes people want the car without really needing the car. And that emotional factor in design is, is vital. It's extremely important that you, 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 you create a product that somebody necessarily doesn't need it, but wants it. If you hit that, you've pretty much hit the magic 
you know, you found the golden chalice or, um, what drives that emotional attachment? Like uh, how is that between sort of engineering design marketing? Like how do those interplay together? Well, it's, it's, I mean, design is all about emotion. So what you're, you're counting on is that the design will be a main factor, one of the main factors to buy in that product. So, you know, if you're in the market for a, a budget car or an everyday car, you're, 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 uh, so many cars cover that well enough today that design tends to be the, the deciding factor when it comes to making that decision of what car I want. You know, what does the brand represent and what does the car look like? I'm, I'm going to be riding, driving this thing and my neighbors will be seeing me in it and they'll judge me, you know, my taste on, on this. So design is, is a very, very important factor when it does come to, to designing, the, the, to, to selling the product. So companies are starting now, I think, to put a huge value on basically the design of the, um, of the vehicle. So, um, yeah. So, well, I, I like, I, I think that's really important. I want to switch gears just a little subtly here, uh, in terms of w- what is the role of, what role does curiosity play with designers in an organization? such as yourself and your experiences and, and sort of like just in general. Yeah. And that's, it, it, that's everything there. Shin curiosity is, is the key. Basically the, the, the driving factor for innovation is the key to everything in the whole process. But a lot of people seem to think that curiosity slows things down. Like, no, you don't... no, no, no. I mean, you have to, you have to take things, you know, slowly when you're, when you're designing new products, obviously, but curiosity is that, grand spark that big bang that kicks everything off you know because without that we don't innovate it's i wouldn't say the main ingredient but it's the first ingredient that you need for everything else to to succeed along the process um i i i love speaking about curiosity it's probably my favorite absolute favorite subject to to talk about um Curiosity, basically, I think we're all pretty much, uh, we start life being very curious about things. Um, it's it's a, sort of a factor of, of life that kids are always asking why, you know, or how does this work, or whatever. Um, but like I said, it is absolutely the, the thing that makes us uh, visionaries. Basically, if you can start out being curious, um, that will lead to the imagination, which then will lead to the creativity that you need to, to generate. And that also leads to being a visionary and then you actually have to execute it. But, but yeah, I think I would say curiosity is, is the most important thing when, when you speak about innovation, it's basically, it's, um, it makes you smarter. Um, you know, it's, it's sometimes considered even more important than the knowledge. Um, so yeah, it's, it's critical. <laughs> well, what do organizations do to like remove curiosity from not only designers, but from everybody, but your experience as a designer, what do they, what do they do that gets in the way of that curiosity? Um, they pretty much, um, put blocks in your way, I guess, as a designer to, to being curious. They, like I said, they tried to make sure that what you're doing is, is playing it safe. Um, the problem with playing it safe again is you're being, you know, you could risk being stagnant. You could risk, um, you know, going backwards even. Um, they don't encourage it enough. It, it basically, it plays on the fact that if you, if you're not curious, you're basically stifling the, the all important innovation factor. I'd say that you, that, that, that all companies would need, or at least a part of the company needs to, to be thinking about innovation. So, um, it's almost as if success is the seeds of its own destruction here in the sense of you take risks and then you become successful in part because of those risks. And then you want to protect that success. So you take fewer risks and you're more, uh, instead of innovative in the sense of designing something new from scratch, you're more like improvements, but that allows somebody else that's going to take the risk, the chance to sort of displace you yeah that's true i mean um you know any any time uh we we stop uh that curiosity factor it's going to be um frustrating obviously from the designer side um it's going to stop that connection that you know many times uh when we're talking about curiosity um what we're doing is we're putting together 
what I what I think are bits of knowledge together. You know, you're connecting bits of knowledge that probably don't have much to do with each other. And when you connect those bits of knowledge, it allows you to think of new ideas. It allows you to 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 be more um, creative, obviously. And the more creative you are, the more solutions you you can generate from becoming more knowledgeable about different things. That sort of sucks you in into being you know, even more curious. So it's it's a kind of a, a spiral. Um, if you're not curious, if you're not wired to to act on it, then you're pretty much looking at a dim or a, a not optimized solution, I would call it. You have to be sort of um, relevant in the way you think. Mm. Uh, it's important that when we think about um, how to apply curiosity, you have to you have to understand that if you're not relevant with the times and, and up to date with things that are being developed or, or I wouldn't even say discovered because things is, you know, everything exists. You just have to find it pretty much dig into it. Um, a lot of it comes from, from research obviously, but that, that process of basically being able to apply your curiosity, uh, the, uh, it kind of is what we call cross. I, I was speaking recently at a, um, at a summit uh, about cross industry innovation, where basically you put teams together of people who don't really have much in common, but they all, I mean, they're all passionate obviously about what they do, but their interests are pretty varied. And what you do is you, you create this, um, this force or this energy where all these different ideas come together and start bouncing off of each other. And what you do is you create this, 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 this basically this, this force of, of innovation, of being able to put different ideas together that you never would have had in the first place. Um, you know, you can, you can apply that obviously in different ways. Um, people say, how do you get, you know, how do you become curious or how do you become creative? Uh, it's pretty much basically just putting different, different thoughts, different ideas together that, um, start bouncing off of each other. And the more you learn, the more you apply it, um, the wider the ideas become, the, the, the energy grows and you start coming out with products that you probably never would have thought about on your own in the first place. How do you see computers interacting with design in the future? Um, not in the sense of curiosity, but in terms of, do you think like designers will be displaced by AI designing things? What role does it have in terms of creating design now? And how does that, how does that take the designer from the medium? I mean, can you just explore that for a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, at the risk of sounding like I'm old school, um, (laughs) not that computers are a bad thing. Um, they are not, they actually help us, you know, (laughs) obviously help us in terms of churning out the work a lot quicker and giving us more options to consider. But when we're talking specifically about something that, I mean, design is, is pretty much a combination of art and science. It's not pure art, it's not pure science, but you have to blend the two together. Um, when you let a computer do a lot of the work, you're losing the essence of design, which is design is a, is a, is a, like I said, it's an emotional product and, and you can oftentimes get closer to success when you, when you add in that human touch as, as we call it computers rule that out they they kind of you know they're, they're cold tools that allow us to do our job but they're lacking the emotional side of it so i think it's good to use computers obviously but i would never ever believe in using a computer as a as a tool for creativity at the beginning uh, you can use it later like i said to give you variations and options and things like that and maybe to speed up the development process but design from a design point of view where you're probably trying to 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 make something um, even if it's you know we, we all strive for perfection but a lot of times great design uh backs off from perfection because there's a there's something there's something perfect about not being perfect if that makes any sense um what what we try to do with designers to, as designers is try to make something not look right so much but as feel right if it feels mm. right then it tends to be right you can measure things and and the measurements can be exact and and still it looks off but if your gut instinct <laughs> tells you that it's right most often it is but uh that's another subject because gut instinct uh I was thinking about it uh earlier was 
you know, people rely a lot of times on gut instinct, but they rely on it too soon in their careers. And that is probably a mistake. I think when you feel that something is right, um, that is a reliable uh, guide when you've got pretty much the the experience that what your gut instinct is telling you is valid. Um, you, know, you don't want to rely on something that hasn't been proven before. But if you tend to, to be successful with your gut instinct, that is pretty much a good, um, uh, not a tool, but a good good way to, to evaluate your, your designs. Um, so yeah, computers, I'd say they, they, they do help us. But I can't imagine anything, you know, if you look back at the history of art, history of sculptures, a lot of those things that were, you know, still considered today to be timeless masterpieces or enduring masterpieces never could have been done with a computer. Um, it, it, they've always got a bit of imperfection that makes them, you know. Uh, very human in a way. Very human, yeah, yeah. Sometimes something that is absolutely spot on just doesn't feel right. You you can't warm up to it. Um so yeah, I've I've always tried to stay away from computers and design until absolutely necessary. Today's age of of design of um, any product basically has to go eventually to that stage of being, you know, used. A, a computer comes into the process to either to to um, deliver the the design to a team to to actually build it, the engineering side of it. Um, but if you can hold out as long as you can during the actual uh, design and ideation phase, and you're going to come up with a much, probably a much more sensual and attractive product than if you rely too much on computers. And that's a little bit what I don't like about uh, training, the training of designers in, in, in our systems today is that a lot of them are starting to rely too much on, on computers and you ask them to sketch something and they find they have a hard time sketching mm. in the way that the traditional way of sketching was, was always a big thing when I was coming up through the ranks it was pretty much your work and not the computer's work and uh, you know there's always the artistic license that comes into into play and you can do that when you're when you're doing it uh, with your hand or with your own uh, input but a computer basically will give you a, a a zero or one output on most things and that that is a cold number or cold way to operate let's switch gears and talk about cars specifically now your passion mm -hmm. um uh, what what are the things that people who design cars wish that consumers knew about the cars? And and you can you can talk us through the gamut. I mean, you've done sort of like um, all ranges of cars in terms of price, all the way up to like the P one versus the Fiat five hundred. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, are they the same things? Are they different? Like. Can you from a designer's point of view, it's kind of like, you know, you often get asked, what's your favorite design that you've ever done? Or I get asked that a lot. And and again, you know, you want to you want to answer the question, but I find it extremely hard to answer that question because you put as much blood and guts and, and sweat into designing the small details and the small cars and the the lesser expensive ones as you do in the in the bigger ones. It's much like, you know, I would I would compare it to being asked which is your favorite child unless you've got a real black sheep in the family you're probably going to end up saying that all of them are your favorites just they're all different so um i i can't say that you know designing one car is 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 funner than designing another car they're all important but um in one respect i i think that designing uh between that whole range of of cars from a your basic uh get me from here to there kind of car to the one where you just stare at it in the garage and you know, have a glass of wine while you're looking at it. Um, the thing is design, basically it's, it's, it's more expensive to design a bad car, a car that's not successful than it is to design a, a very expensive, a, a well-designed car. It costs more to make a mistake than it does to not make a mistake. If you, if you get what I mean, what I mean there. Um, Can you expand on that? Yeah you're trying to capture what I call that emotional uh, factor, which is they both turn uh, the the person, the consumer on in such a way that he, he really wants that car. Um, but at the same time, you know, your budget kind of can control what you do to add excitement mm. to, the, to the, to the end product. I, th I think it's apt actually that you mention 
kind of turning you on as a means to buying the car because I remember something in the research I was doing for you about the BMW Mini, the Cooper Mini being um, inspired by a woman yeah and a woman's body can you can you talk to me about that um yeah i mean the thing with i what i find uh really interesting about design is um and like i said there's a bit of a science to design um when you design for something that's appealing uh emotionally appealing you have to i mean most designers don't just pull pull something out of thin air they have to get their inspiration from some source or some 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 original thing that that um that they that they feel you know they like or feel connected to i've always been uh very interested in in the art of making something beautiful and whether it be architecture whether it be furniture or anything like that there's you know beautiful in in a in the right way is enduring. It doesn't, doesn't ever uh, go out of fashion. Um, but when I design every, pretty much everything I've ever designed has a connection, uh, personal connection to nature for me. Um, one of my favorite subjects always has been biology and, uh, and, and nature. And I've always tried to find my inspiration through nature pretty much. Um, it is a science. We call it biomimicry and it's pretty much the science of, of uh, looking for, uh, solutions in 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 the way that nature has already figured it out for us. Um, so when I when I design, my inspiration doesn't come from let's say things that are um, transient or or in one year and out the next. It's basically looking for the solutions that nature provides us, and and basically most things in nature, uh, coming close to ninety nine percent of them would would be. Um, pretty much considered to be attractive in the first place. Um, so when I look at uh, as inspiration from there, the 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 things that I look for, things that you feel comfortable for, the, the inspiration of things, shapes that you feel comfortable with, and uh, and don't jar you or don't basically um, surprise you in a negative way. When I designed the mini, I was looking for those shapes in nature, pretty much that you uh, would see as familiar without really realizing what you were looking at uh, at the first instance. Um, I know I spoke when I spoke about how I designed the mini that it had to be reminiscent of the original one, uh, simply because the original one was such an iconic uh, car of the 20th century that it wouldn't make sense to make a replacement that just sort of uh, started off in another direction. It had to carry over a lot of that character character of the original and bring in some of the you know the future technology that we developed over the years but at the same time the shapes could be influenced in such a way that it did come across as something that you wanted to get closer to a lot of the shapes that we see you know if i say the female body well it's it's just simply because those are shapes that uh we see as nice shapes i don't want to say it in a you know mean it in a sensual way but those are comforting shapes shapes that most people appreciate as being uh, attractive, appealing, um, friendly in a way, um, enticing in other ways. But uh, yeah, so I think I think that was a big factor in the design and the acceptance of the design of the new Mini was it did recall obviously the iconic look of the original one, but at the same time, it 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 didn't make you feel like it was some kind of uh, uh, being or, or vehicle that just suddenly appeared on the market as being something revolutionary, revolutionary in its, in its, uh, design language. It had to feel, um, accepted right from the beginning, I'd say. And, and, and those shapes did very much help it to, to achieve that. And, and was there an example of a, um, a fish or was it a cheetah that sort of inspired the P1? Um, there was, yeah, that's a, uh, an interesting story. I remember um, uh, when I first started with uh, McLaren, um, I moved. Uh, I had to. I moved to England, obviously, and uh, was very close to to the headquarters, living there. But I had a few weeks off still, and I um, uh, I went off to the Caribbean and uh, went to an island where they uh, basically had some uh, trophies around on the uh, on the walls. And I noticed this sailfish above the main reception desk, and I asked the lady there, um, 
basically, why is this up there on the wall? It's taking up such a big amount of space there. And she said, well, I don't know. The owner caught it, and he's very proud of it. If you speak to the owner, he'll probably explain it a bit better to you. So I spoke to him, and he said, well, dang, don't you know how hard it is to catch those fish? <laughs> they were so fast. And I, I, I thought, well, yeah, they must be fast, obviously. But he says, well, they're not only fast. They're much faster than a cheetah. And so that, that, that spiked my curiosity. And uh, again, so I started researching it over the next few days and found out that for certain reasons that the, the, the sailfish could get up to over 70 miles an hour, which if you compare it to a 50-ish mile an hour cheetah, that's a huge difference. And especially if it's going through you know, much denser media. Yeah, it's going media. through water versus air. Yeah, there's got to be a secret there that somebody can learn from or use. And uh, I found out that basically the scales um, helped generate little um, bubbles, I guess, to put it very simply, little bubbles of air uh, around it, which then will create sort of an air pocket or a film of air around it, which then creates another thing, which is a bit of uh, like a suction, which will pull the fish even faster forward. Um, and so this 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 concept of using the the the, the scales of the fish uh, became something that I, I started to think. Well, how can we apply that to to the design? And and this new P one, the McLaren P one that you're referring to, was or, or its mission was to be the greatest car that McLaren had ever built up to that point, um, surpassing hopefully even the F one that they'd made in the middle 90s which is an iconic supercar that still today has 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 its uh incredible pull and and uh appeal but basically um i was able to to start with a clean sheet of paper on that design of the p1 and uh again to make it the best in its class i was trying to look for every advantage i could find um so i i basically on the way back I stopped off in miami and picked up a sailfish that had just been uh caught and bought it uh, right there and had it taxidermied downtown in Miami. And then they shipped it back to uh, Heathrow Airport, albeit in a massive package that uh, required me to get one of the Formula One trucks to go pick, pick it up because of the size <laughs> of it. And that didn't turn I out. I can just too, imagine that expense report. It wasn't nice. I mean, I almost lost my job because of the uh, finance director being a bit upset about my use of the credit card, the company credit card, and uh, it was um, it wasn't good. But at the same time, I tried to explain to them, you know, that designers think in, in these ways, and you have to get, uh, you know, ex uh, accept that this new design department at McLaren was out to do things a little bit differently, and we had to find every advantage we could in the book to to beat the competitors. So uh, I don't, I still to this day don't think he he, he agreed to it. But at the same time. Uh, we we put that fish through the, the the whole analysis of why and how it, it accomplished what it did, and like I said, the uh, the what we call the uh, scanning uh, process of of the actual mathematics of the of the scales were applied. We we use that to uh, put into the air intake ducts on the P1 to to make to actually accelerate the air going into the car. So if you feed more air into an engine, basically you're going to get more power out of it. So we found a, a distinct advantage by using these scales to to improve the airflow. And uh, it, it was big. I mean, the, the, the amount of increase in volume of air was, uh, was, was enough to blow away the engineers and uh, make them see that, yeah, designers sometimes can be <laughs> a good a good part of the organization <laughs> these crazy guys yeah you, you mentioned design language a few minutes ago what does what does that mean what is a design language for those of us who are uninitiated um well design language is basically the brand's uh recognition factor if a company is doing it right a, a consumer should be able to look at the car and and understand who makes that car what brand of car that is um, that is done by creating a look and that look is like a language, I guess you could say. It's uh, more than just a face. It's basically um, features on the car that are used as strong design points to, to brand that image. So if you look at certain companies, they'll have certain factors that may, you know, be it colors or shapes or font styles or whatever that will associate uh, with or typify the company. Um, you know, you'll be able to identify the company right away without knowing that it's actually that company that is is being talked about. So when you speak about design language, um, what we tried to do is make 
a car look uniquely uh, unique to that brand. In other words, the shape of the car, different types of uh, elements on the car, such as the grill, uh, the front end grill, the lamps, the door handles. Some of those things can, I wouldn't say commonize them because that can look cheap sometimes, but at the same time, if you can give a feel that is basically sort of what you would see in a family where you have a brother and a sister looking similar, they're not exactly the same, obviously, but they will have a look that resembles each other, resembles their parents. Um, and so what you try to do is build that. Um, a lot of companies do it well. Other companies might not do it so well. Um, but that is, again, one of the objectives of a designer uh, is to either continue that look in such a way that it's still progressive because if you hold hold on to it too tightly, then it's it, it can get overused and, and boring in the end um, and, and stagnant. Also, but what you tried to do is is um, progress it uh, progressively. You don't want to make big jumps in the design language because otherwise it becomes, uh, you know, uh, either diluted too quickly or or indistinguishable or uh, looks too much like somebody else's <laughs> design language. So it's a, it's a it's a it's a bit of a balance. But you want to always move that design language, that design. Um, recognition factor of, of, of a product in a way that every time you come out with a new product, it doesn't look the same, but it looks either, um, you can't say better because design is so subjective, but you can say it sort of looks instantly recognizable, absolutely instantly recognizable and more advanced in, in one way or another. Sort of like Ferrari or Porsche come to mind when you, you say that? Yeah. I mean, some companies paint themselves into a corner and it's hard to get out. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 a, yeah. it's a balancing act, obviously. If you, if you don't change enough, you can be criticized for not advancing or not, like I said earlier, not being relevant. But at the same time, if you can, um, if you can come up with fresh ways of interpreting something, like adding a new word to a language that kind of expresses or defines something a little bit better... Um, then, then you're doing it right. You, you've mentioned in the past, sort of, you, you mentioned criticizing, which sort of jawed this in my memory, but you mentioned in the past when you're drawing a car, there's two of you, sort of like the person drawing the car and then mm. the person critiquing it. And I think that's something we, we all resonate with because when we're doing something, we're also, we're not only doing it, maybe mm. not in the present moment, but we're also critiquing ourselves. And how do you balance the tension between those two? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good, that's a, I, I don't know. It's sort of, um, a way that comes out of your own self. You, you, I mean, all designers are extremely self-critical, I'd say, you know, uh, a lot of them, a lot of us maybe aren't sure of what we're doing sometimes. And you look for justification or approval from the other people. And obviously if you, you do something great and, and everybody loves it, then you've done a great job, but it's really, a uh, a real, a deep cut to the, uh, to, 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 to the designer when somebody criticizes his design. Um, but when you're actually designing, like, like you mentioned, if for me, it's not so much about thinking while I'm designing. I, I pretty much think about, I mean, the other thing is you have to be uh, aware that when you design, there's a lot of research that has to be done before you start designing. I think a lot of designers might fall into that trap of where they just start designing a new product immediately when they get a brief to, or a project to do. Um, for me, it's all about starting with the vision, starting with trying to envision the outcome. And it's a process mm. pretty much. You can't, I mean, you can obviously start, but it's just basically putting lines on paper that r really don't have any end result. You, you have to start, I think, with researching your design goal first, and you have to imagine it before you actually carry it out. It's people oftentimes about, talk about working in, in reverse, you know, you start out with what you want to see and what you envision as the final result. And then you sort of work backwards. I, I, I can see the value of that, but from a design point of view, what I try to do is see the end result first. And then when I've seen it or, or, or tried to imagine the, the best outcome, then I, I, I just let my hand start working and, and subconsciously it's, it's amazing. It's a, it's, it's being in the groove. I've, I think people can relate that when, when you do something that um, basically comes up uh, across as being effortless or very easy, it's not. It's you've done your research, um, you've practiced enough to understand that you, you have the talents 
to to apply them to a design you you understand proportion just understand all the um the basics then you let then you let the artistic side of yourself or the um the experience come out by itself you don't have to push it you just look, start looking at almost like looking at um variants when you're drawing um but yeah it's uh it, it's it's an interesting and amazing process when you can actually draw nice things without putting the effort or the obvious effort that you need to put into it without without making it seem like you're actually thinking while you're drawing it it's a it's a subconscious act in a in a way it almost sounds like mastery yeah well it's it looks like magic because like, yeah, i know when i'm drawing yeah. people, people are fascinated but i'm really not thinking I, I know what the end goal is i know what i have to achieve with the design and you won't just do one design obviously and and say that's the end of it and here you go uh, let's go do it you'll go through a whole sketching process but one one sketch will lead to another sketch and will successively lead to to many more sketches obviously but it's not sitting there trying to think where each line goes it's basically letting your your subconscious thoughts of the end product come out uh as as they want to come out you know it's you're watching it you're being critical of it obviously but uh you're not there at that moment in time to to change anything you're just observing right. it and and later you can go back and judge it i would say what are some of the trade-offs you have to think about when designing a car well, uh, the big one is basically we have to design a car that um, can be brought to the market and success successfully uh, received by the uh, by by the consumer, obviously. But what they have to understand is that we're working uh, from a point of view that has to pass so many rules and legislation and certification things that there are quite a few things that restrict you from doing the say the ultimate beautiful car that you could design um they'll they'll put in things every year you'll come across new regulations that force you to 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 remember or to 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 force you to do something that you really almost have to compromise the design on for and uh one of the big factors there is that uh, there's always a, a big push for safety, whether it be passenger, or, uh, you know, people inside the car safety or pedestrian safety or, or whatever. And those regulations are constantly pushing designers to, to compromise their designs to make the vehicle uh, safer. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of opportunities, obviously, because, one of the things about driver safety, which is very interesting, is a lot of the problems with accidents or, or, or incidents like that are a result of driver error. And there's a huge movement now, we all know about it, to, going towards autonomous driving. Um, autonomous driving rules out the driver in a lot of instances. And, and basically, if you can take the driver uh, factor away, you're probably in one way going to... Uh, to make cars safer, obviously, and then you can start to change the design in such a way that you're not thinking so much about the driver being uh, constantly, um, you know, aware of the situation around them. He can start to relax, and the interior of the design of the car can start to become a little bit more. And this is what I see as becoming the new future of design: is the interior is going to start playing out as more of a. Um, uh, an entertainment or a social or a working or a relaxing mm. environment so that you can start to express more interesting designs on the interiors of the car. Um, I want to, I want to get into the future sort of of cars, but just before we get there, one, one quick question about sort of the efficiency of cars today. Mm -hmm. Like what would make, how do we make cars more efficient? Like um, what it is, I I've heard that the, the, you know, the, side mirrors, you know, uh, mm -hmm. create, I think it's five or 10% of the drag on a car and just getting rid of those would automatically increase fuel efficiency. So I can mm -hmm. see that sort of changing if that's true in the future with autonomous cars. Um, but what are the things that we can do today or that are being worked on behind the scenes that we don't see to make cars more efficient before we get to that sort of place? Yeah. Um, obviously if we're looking at today's cars and, and we're looking at fuel propelled cars then we're looking at aerodynamic efficiency but the trend now i think is is we're almost 
uh, being not being forced, but the the general view now is that we have to start looking more at ways of not using the world's resources. So, so not looking at fossil fuels. And, and, and that brings into uh, play the whole uh, game about electrical uh, mm. propelled cars, if you want to call it that way. And, and what that means is that we're, we're not so much now in need of aerodynamic aids or, or aerodynamic shapes that will allow us or, or allow us to save fuel in terms of efficiency. So saving fuel is, is basically based on um, improving the aerodynamics of a car, as well as handling, obviously. But we are limited to uh, speeds on most roads where the aerodynamics don't play a huge uh, part of, of the efficiency. So <clears throat> obviously, the faster you go, the more dynamic the car, the less fuel it uses. But um, I, uh, like I said, we, we, we can't really go that fast these days. So as soon as we move into the world of uh, electrical cars, electric cars, we start looking at ways that the electrical side can improve the uh, efficiency of a car. So what that does, it means um, uh, we can go with a lot smaller uh, areas needed to be used for the, the motors. Basically, you can either use in-wheel motors for the electrics, or you can use a, a basically an electric uh, uh, motor that can be very small. It can be packaged quite small, and you do have to consider batteries, but those can be placed in ways that don't intrude on the on the interiors of the car. But I think efficiency is going to come in the future through um, the advantages of, of smaller uh, things needed within the car because electronics is all about reducing bulk and size and hopefully weight. Um, the other thing is rolling resistance, what we call rolling resistance of the tires. Um, if you can eliminate that that friction, then uh, you're, you're helping the car to go with a lot less uh, power needed to push it forward. Um, forward. And so we're going to be looking probably at new ways of of making tires in such a way that they become thinner and still have maximum adhesion in all circumstances. And um, efficiency, I can also see in terms of how you basically use the vehicle. Um, if we think about vehicles being parked most of the time, okay, they're not very efficient in that way. But if we can uh, use the vehicle during during our journeys, our trips from one place to another, if we can use the vehicle as a, as a zone or a... a an area where we can actually do something else and not be so, you know, uh, uh, needed to drive the vehicle, then we're also looking at more efficiency. So like I mentioned earlier, if we can open up the interior to be in a, a more usable space in terms of work or socialization or relaxation even, um, then, then that's a huge way of opening up the, um, the visibility or the efficiency side. Do you see the future, the, the short-term future, as in we own our own autonomous vehicle or we're using a service? Yeah, that's, uh, I, I feel really strongly about that. Because I think that would, that would affect design a lot. Absolutely, it? absolutely. But you still, I mean, design is all about, like I said, you want products to be desirable. But the, the general trend, what I see nowadays is the the younger generations are less into owning things. They're more about the experience. So I think there there is going to be obviously a trend to uh, move away from owning vehicles, but there will also still remain those people who want want to own the product itself. In other words, uh, the younger generation will be about getting from here to there in a shared experience kind of way or or not having to worry about owning a product that will have to be insured or, or you know, maintained or resold and anything like that. So that, and then obviously the other side, like a, about owning your own vehicle, people always want to, to own something. Um, but it, it means that design in both cases is always going to be important. I don't think we're ever going to return to an age or, or be at a sort of retrogress to an age where design becomes less important. I think it's always going to be a factor in in wanting to be seen with that product and, and how you identify yourself with that with that product. Do you think that like the speed limits will increase in autonomous vehicles and then aerodynamics will actually play a bigger role? And and the second sort of follow on to this is, I know I'm asking a lot of questions about no. the future, which is hard to predict, but <laughs> you, car designers are always working five to 10 years in the future yeah. anyway. And do, yeah. do you see sort of like 
electric vehicles as a stopgap or the end solution? Like, is there a better solution on the horizon? Um, yeah, there's always going to be a better solution, obviously. I mean, uh, for me, it, it is, like you said, a stopgap because I can see, or we all know there are better solutions because, you know, electrics aren't that efficient in terms of um, what you do later with the batteries or, or, many, or how you actually produce the batteries. There's, there's a lot of issues with that. But I do see... Um, um, advances in, in propulsion technology coming, but they just probably won't happen in the next generation of cars, I would say. There, there's a lot of um, reasons why that won't happen, mostly probably because of the economics of it at the moment. And, um, you know, you have to build up also a lot of the uh, infrastructure network to accommodate mm. that. And at the moment, um, we're having a tough enough time with, with the electric side that moving on from there is going to take us... Uh, probably a huge generation jump to get there. Um, but yeah, the the electric side is a good uh, next step, I think. Um, we're even going right now through the hybrid step where you do combine, you know, um, fuel with electrics to get the best of both worlds when, when, in, when and if needed. But um, the electrics will probably be with, be with us for quite a while until the next probably hydrogen step comes in. And um, I see that as one day being probably the, the successor to the electric market or the electric uh, age that we're going through now. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can, you can even advance on that. There's, there's you know, the, the, the idea that atomic power could at some time in the, in the future if we're, we're around it could become a next step also. That's a, there's a bit of, uh, you know, you have to take a reality check with, with the safety side of it, obviously, but it can be a next uh, ultimate step that provides us with, with say, endless power. How, how far away are we from completely autonomous vehicles, regardless of whether there's a steering well, wheel in it or not? Um, yeah. Um, in, in your opinion, I, I see autonomous vehicles as a as a as a vision um, of of hope. You know that at some point in the future we'll be able to do it. Uh, but the problem with that is it's it's what we call level five, where the car can basically be expected to cover any potentially dangerous situation and cover it in in a way that is ethically or morally correct, because there are times when when it will have to decide uh, on something that is um, critical, very critical, and and uh, that has to be judged, you know, in, in a certain way. It's hard to say if a machine can make a better decision than a person at some time, at a critical time. Um, but I would say that until we have that, what we call level five, where the cars are pretty much confident of of every situation can be that every situation can be handled properly um it's going to be difficult to see it on the road uh in in any um major way because you'll always at least for the next i don't know decades i would say you're not going to have all cars being intelligent on the road it's very interesting if you look into that biomimicry side of things where um you'll see fish schools of fish you'll see uh swarms of birds starlings they call them that type of bird where they all basically move in rhythm to each other it's it's one of the most amazing sights in nature is to see um that swarm of of birds basically all in unison and uh, the one on on one side 300 meters over on the other side they're basically in cohesion and moving in, in in the same rhythm um which is the sixth sense uh still today not i don't think we've we've grasped the the idea of how that actually happens but unless you can get cars on the road to 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 do that um your speed limits are going to have to be in place because uh it's almost as if saying a, a smart car and a not smart car interacting there's always going to be the risk of of the of the not smart car doing something uh, that puts the other cars in danger. So you're until we can get 100% of the cars working on the same level, I don't think we're going to see it. And you could say there is a solution of putting all the level five cars in one specific lane or, or few mm. lanes work together. And then the cars that are not autonomous, they can go in the other lane. Um, the thing with the uh, the level five that will allow you to raise the speed limits because you could get a lot closer to the cars in front of you. Um, the the density of traffic is going to increase so much over the next few years or the next decades that we are going to have to find a way to 
to get these cars closer together without reducing speed. So aut autonomous driving is one of the uh, the solutions to that. I think if we can get the cars more closer together without risking, you know, being safe because they're all intelligent, they understand how uh, the distance is needed and, and uh, react to each other, that will improve. But I, I don't see a, a full system of autonomous driving cars working in the near future. Um, it'll happen in the sky, I think, before it will happen uh, on on the ground. Why don't we see, like, I'm trying to think, like, what would be interesting here is, like, racing as autonomous vehicles, right? Because you have a closed track, you have high speeds, you could, in theory, push the absolute limit of mm. the car. Mm. And then you're you're not competing on driving ability as much as uh, improving sort of the technology, but you're, you're sort of like, then you change it from the human element of driving the car to the sort of like the design engineering element, the level of competition becomes more about that, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, you're probably, Is anybody doing that. No, there's, <laughs> there is, uh, uh, formula E, which is basically electric cars racing, uh, against each other. But, uh, the, the, the concept that you're speaking about is pretty much letting cars race against each other, uh, without a pilot, without a driver, um, that is a good, um, say, a technology carrier or a way to, to, to come up with new ideas of how to do that um, and, and speed being a factor and all that. But there are still accidents happening there. And uh, those cars yet, the robo cars, they call them, uh, hasn't really progressed to any level yet where – where they're, they're pretty much running on what we call AI, where the cars learn the circuit and they can start mm. to accelerate. And we see that also with drone competitions where people are, are flying the drones. Uh, with, yeah, I've watched uh, some of those. They're crazy. Like the, the yeah. reflexes on these people are just... Yeah. It's amazing. It's, uh, it's pretty exciting to watch, but you can see that they still have accidents and they still have a lot of issues to overcome. So um, we, we need some way of, obviously, of, of these new systems of moving forward of mobility coming to fruition but i think uh in the long run it's going to take a lot more uh, uh research a lot more understanding of of nature how they do it it's uh it's one of the things i've been trying to to understand for a long time is is how do they develop the sixth sense of knowing what the uh the other guy is doing <laughs> As he's doing it, it's it's uh, it's just I don't want to say it's impossible because I'd never like saying something is impossible. Um, we have to dig deeper and find out, you know, how it actually occurs. But um, for me, it's one of the big mysteries. How do we get level five cars all at the same level at the same time? But you also think, I mean, that the future of transportation is more in the air than on the ground. Um, I wouldn't say it's the future. I would say it's uh, it's um, an option. You know, the the thing with ground transportation is we already have the network for it, and we have uh, an, an infrastructure that will that, that is there, and obviously it can be improved, and we need to improve it because we have so many traffic jams that uh, are frustrating. Nobody wants to spend time just you know taking extra extra time to get somewhere. So uh, we'll always be looking at ways to to move forward faster and safer in the future. Um, you know, they've, they've got new concepts with the high-speed trains coming now in most, in, in many countries. And we have uh, also what we call the Hyperloop system, which is being really considered as something that can come in the next few decades. Very expensive, but it's a, it's a very efficient way of traveling if they can nail it. <laughs> um, but I do see the sky as being one of the big ways to to ease the flow or to get people from one place to another a lot quicker than we do today. And and um, as in everything, safety is key there. It's, uh, you know, uh, we, we all uh, see flying, we saw flying in the past as being a little bit dangerous, but it's now become probably the the safest way, actually, uh, statistically, of getting from, from A to B. Um, but if we are to start flying what we call, uh, in this new age of mobility, it will mean um, vehicles that can probably go shorter distances than plane or, or, mm. or tend to go shorter distances than airplanes. Um, and, but, and but how much of, like, what makes airplanes the, the safest is, like, there's been 
innovation in airplanes, but they sort of look the same as the 60s and yeah. they're heavily regulated. They're slow to change. And that's part of what's made it safe. And so when we're talking about more innovative approaches, hmm. is is it a tension between that safety and um, inventing something new? Or um, how do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing that increases safety, um, the way the, the way they do it in aviation, at least, is they do, they use something called redundancy, which means if something fails, they'll have a backup system. And, and the, the chance of something failing is, 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 you know, at a very high um, level of improbability. Um, so they use redundancy, basically, if something fails, that shouldn't fail to have a back backup system for it um but i think the innovation side of aviation hasn't been reached yet because we're still using um ideas of aerodynamics that are pretty much i'd say outdated still and 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 um uh, not i mean we're using lift wings for lift we're using um you know propulsion methods that are still antiquated or not not antiquated but just haven't really pushed pushed forward very much the the most innovation comes obviously from from the military uh from military aviation where planes are basically designed to be uh or or these military aircraft are designed to be unstable so they can maneuver much more quickly um but there are there are innovations to be found in 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 in, in nature in birds to 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 make planes look completely different and much more efficient than what we have today um I wouldn't call planes today boring, but um, they're basically, I would say, you know, you have most often in the commercial world, a, a tube with a few wings uh, attached to it. And obviously that's space efficient and it's easy to build and uh, and to repair and to maintain. Uh, but at the same time, I think we're losing out a lot on what an aircraft in the future potentially could be used could be. for or could look like. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, we're, we're going with man-made solutions pretty much. And I think if we look uh, in nature how they do it, uh, wings aren't attached. They're basically growing out <laughs> of a surface. It's uh, it's a lot more efficient. Uh, obviously, birds have different functions and different ways of, of doing the task at hand. Um, not every animal or every organism does the, the job with the same solution. They find different ways to to, to achieve it. But there is um, uh, an advantage, I think, in, in, for example, what I'm working or I've been working on uh, in terms of aircraft design lately or recently is the, the way of combining different shapes in nature to achieve uh, an, a very efficient uh, functioning flying object. Um, I won't go into too much detail, obviously, but the basic concept is that if you looked up into the sky and thought you were seeing a fish, then you're on the right track because of what we spoke before. Fish, fish are much more efficient at creating aerodynamic shapes or hydrodynamic shapes, mm. actually, than than planes are. So, I think we're looking at the wrong direction. We should be looking under the sea as as opposed to <laughs> looking at standard aerodynamic shapes when we want to do new aircraft design. Yeah, I, th I think nature has like figured out a lot of things that, and I, I've never heard the term sort of biomimicry before, but I, uh, I, I think that resonates a lot with me in the sense that we don't, we don't have to come up with everything new ourselves. We can look um, to nature for not only inspiration, but solving problems that we sort of have or giving us at least a placeholder for where to begin. Yeah, I mean, nature is, you know, it's, 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 it's our, uh, you know, there's nothing futuristic in nature. It's all there. All we have to do is peel back the layers and find out how they've managed to make something successful because obviously in, in, in nature, if something's not well designed, it won't stick around for very long. So there are solutions in nature, which, which are surprising to us today. Obviously, we're still looking at solutions that astound us or that fascinate us or that, that we think, you know, magical almost in a way or, uh, but again, the, the it kind of makes me wonder if like we could go back and look at animals that were extinct and look at uh, and use them for inspiration, not in the sense that they didn't work, but they didn't work in a particular environment. And that yeah. particular environment, um, you know, might have changed or, or maybe better suited to our needs today True. in the environment that we control a little bit more of. Yeah, that's the, I think you nailed, you said it right there. The, the key word is adaption. If, if you can't adapt, you're going to pretty much... Uh, 
fail at the task at hand. You you have to be in in the design world. We 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 can't stay with a solution that we've always had. It's always about finding a better way because there's competition out there. You know, it's a it's a dog eat dog world out there. And if you can't find a way to adapt and to change uh, to 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 find the solution for a new for for any problem, then you're going to fall behind. So it's all about be, staying, like we said earlier, staying relevant to the um, to the problem at, at hand. Thank you so much, Frank. This has been an amazing conversation. I think that's a great place to end it, mm. and I really appreciate you taking the time. Great. Thank you very much, Shane. You can find show notes on this episode as well as every other episode at fs.blog slash podcast. If you find this episode valuable, share it on social media and leave a review. To support the podcast, go to fs.blog slash membership and join our learning community. You'll get hand-edited transcripts of all the podcasts and so much more. Thank you for listening. <laughs>